here's some exciting news for you. More people are poised to earn more money in the coming years than ever before in human history. Let's take a quick look at the numbers. In 1900, there were only 5,000 millionaires in America. Fast forward to 2000, and that number skyrocketed to 5 million. That's a staggering increase of 1,000 times. Although there was a leveling off in 2001 and 2002, in recent years, the number of millionaires has surged by 33%. Currently, there are 8.2 million millionaires in America, and the majority of them are self-made. That means they started from scratch, without a penny to their name, and built their wealth in a single generation. Now let's consider the wealthiest individuals in America today. Warren Buffett, Michael Dell, Bill Gates, Paul Allen, and the Walton family, to name a few. What's remarkable is that they are all first-generation multi-billionaires. This underscores the incredible opportunities available in our $12 trillion economy, which is growing by five to $600 billion annually. All this money is flowing through someone's hands, and the goal is to ensure it flows through yours, and importantly, that some of it sticks. So, how can you achieve this goal? The good news is that the blueprint for success has already been laid out. Self-made millionaires have been extensively studied, analyzed, and interviewed. We know precisely who they are, what they do, how they think, and how they make decisions. The key takeaway is this. If you emulate the actions of successful people, you'll eventually achieve the same results. Now some might argue that they started with nothing, and have nothing now. But here's the reality. Most people face financial challenges well into their 40s and 50s. The crucial question is whether you choose to remain in that situation. I certainly didn't have a head start. I came from humble beginnings, didn't finish high school, and could only land laboring jobs. But I refused to let my circumstances define my future. I embarked on a journey of discovery, asking successful people what set them apart. Through sales and various other ventures, I uncovered the law of cause and effect, the fundamental principle that governs success. It's all about understanding that everything happens for a reason, and success leaves clues. By following the footsteps of those who've achieved success, you can replicate their outcomes. However, success rarely comes overnight. It requires perseverance, resilience, and a willingness to learn from failure. Most importantly, it demands action. Too often people give up before even trying, relegating their dreams to a distance someday. But as I've learned, nothing works the first time. Success is about persistence and continual improvement. Years ago, I was asked to speak to 800 entrepreneurs on how to become a self-made millionaire. At first I felt unqualified, but then I realized that the journey to success isn't just about accumulating wealth. It's about becoming the best version of, uh, yourself. It's about developing the qualities and mindset required to achieve your goals. In essence, becoming a self-made millionaire isn't merely about amassing wealth. It's about transforming into a different person. A person who embodies determination, resilience, and a relentless pursuit of excellence. So, as you embark on your journey to success, remember that the path may be challenging, but the rewards are boundless. My friend said, and one of them said, that in order to achieve something you've never achieved before, you have to become someone you've never been before. And it's a really important insight. The qualities you need to develop are qualities on the inside to become a self-made millionaire. They are incredible qualities that make you a vastly better person. Not only better in terms of character, determination, and discipline, but they make you a far better person overall. They round out your character in a far better way. So, the real payoff of becoming wealthy is not because you can eat more or wear more clothes. It's because of the kind of person you become, and the kind of people you associate with and the kind of life you have. So, the things that we're going to talk about now, and I know that you're some of the smartest people in our country, so I'm going to give you these ideas very quickly, like dealing cards. What I found in my research is that there's a series of qualities that self-made millionaires have. If you have these qualities, your success is virtually guaranteed, and if you don't have these qualities, they are learnable. Point number one is that all business or sales skills are learnable. All financial skills are learnable. If you can drive a car, you can learn any skill. If you can drive a car, you can learn this skill. Now number two is you're probably only one skill away from doubling your income right now. You're probably only one skill away from setting yourself on the road to becoming a self-made millionaire. That turns out to be the case for almost everyone. 
And if you don't know what that skill is, maybe over the course of the time we spend together, it'll jump out at you. But whatever it is, you've got to find it out and go to work on it because it is learnable. It's a learnable skill. People say, well, I've never been very good with money. Well, get over it. The fact of the matter is, you can learn what you need to learn to achieve anything that you want to achieve. So, the success secrets of self-made millionaires, give yourself a score of 1 to 10, and if you are weak on one of these, it can be enough to hold you back. If you're strong on all of these, then there's no limit to what you can accomplish. The first is to dream big dreams. Dream big dreams. Practice what is called back from the future thinking and project forward. Develop a vision of yourself as happy, healthy, wealthy, and thin. Practice what top people practice which is what is called idealization. You project forward several years and imagine that your life is perfect in every way. Imagine that you have no limitations. Imagine that you have all the time, all the money, all the friends, all the contacts, all the education, all the experience, and that you could be, have, or do anything you want in life. If you could, what would it be? If your life were perfect in five years, what would it look like? How much would you be earning? How much would you be worth? What kind of family life would you have? What kind of health would you have? What kind of car would you be driving? What would your life be like if you could wave a magic wand and make it perfect in every way? Now what we have found is this is the starting point of great riches and great success in life, is for you to have a dream or a vision of a wonderful future. Here's an exercise that we give people in our audiences. Take a sheet of paper and make up what is called a dream list. Now imagine this is kind of like a kid's Christmas list, and it just allows you to run wild and just write down everything that you could think of that you could possibly want. I had a friend who I taught this to, and he got so excited about it, he bought a spiral notebook, and he began writing. He'd go through the newspaper, and every single thing he saw in the newspaper that was nice, he wrote it down. At the end of the month, he had 500 things that he wanted. The interesting thing was that his life exploded. He activated the law of attraction and he began to attract into his life people, circumstances, ideas, resources, insights, that began to move him toward the accomplishment of the goals, and began to move the goals toward him. Number two is to do what you love to do. Whenever you find people who are really successful in life, they are people who do what they love to do. They love their work. The great rule for success in life is to find something that you love to do, and then find a way to make a living doing it. Now. When you find what you love to do, it will be something that gives you energy, motivates you, enthuses you. It's probably something that you are meant to do from the time you were born. And when you ask self-made millionaires what sort of work they do, they'll often say, I've never worked a day in my life, I just do what I like to do. I had a graduate in my course once who came up to me and said, you know that's interesting. He said, when I was a little boy, I loved to study airplanes. I got airplane books and I had airplane models, and I had toy planes, and then I got into competitions with remote-controlled planes. He said, when I grew up and went to school, I studied aeronautical engineering. He said, today I'm 35. I own three companies. One builds small aircraft, another one repairs and services small aircraft, and another one is in leasing and chartering small aircraft. He said, I've never worked a day in my life. I just played with planes since the time I was a kid. So, one of the things that you can do is go back to the time when you were young, as a child between the ages of 7 and 14, before you discovered boys or girls, and what is it that you really love to do. And you'll often find that within that is something you're supposed to do as an adult. Number three is commit to excellence. Now this is really, really important. And I had a hard time with this as a young man because I was never good at anything. I was never picked for any team. And if I was picked, I was the first person cut. I got lousy grades in every class. I got fired from multiple jobs. I even got fired from a job for pumping gas. Can you imagine that? Being fired for pumping gas because you're no good? They came out and said, You're no good at pumping gas. How many little old ladies can pump gas? Anyway, so I got fired. I went from job to job, and then I discovered that all people who are successful are excellent at what they do. You know the old question they asked Willie Sutton, the bank robber. Why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. Well, being in the top 10% is where the money is. So, 
What you have to do is you have to pay any price and make any sacrifice to get into the top 10% in your field. Now here's the good news. If you're doing what you love to do, you will want to be in the top 10% in your field. If you don't want to be excellent at what you're doing, it means you're in the wrong field. It just means that you're marking time, you're treading water, and there's a lot of people who are in their field and they do their job, and they go home at night, they don't think about their work, and so on. And this kind of an attitude means that you have no future. You have a very shaky present. That crackling sound you hear is the ice breaking under your feet. And you have no future, because if you're not doing what you love to do, and throwing your whole heart into it, you're just marking time. But everybody is designed so that there is something that you love to do, that you can do well. And the fact that you love it means that you probably have the ability to excel at it. So, make this decision to get into the top 10%. And let me tell you what changed my life here. I was struggling in my late 20s, and I learned this. It was a breakthrough thought, is that everybody in the top 10% started in the bottom 10%. Everybody who's doing well was once doing poorly. Everybody who is at the top of your field today, was once not even in your field at all, and didn't even know it existed. What that means is that if you're willing to pay the price and work hard and make the sacrifices, you can get into the top 10%. Now how long does it take? It doesn't take a week or a month. Most people are really impatient. To achieve mastery in your field takes five to seven years. People say, five to seven years? I'll be five to seven years older before I start enjoying the big rewards. Well, how much older will you be in five to seven years anyway? Now here's an important point. Are you ready? The time is going to pass anyway. The time is going to pass. Five to seven years from now, five to seven years will have passed. The only question is, are you going to be at the top of your field, or are you still going to be down there with the mediocre 80? And the wonderful thing is this. Nobody's better than you. And nobody's smarter than you. If anybody else is at the top of the field, it means that you can be at the top of your field. Just go to them and find out how they got there, because they started at the bottom. Now it may take longer for some people and less for others, but everybody who puts one foot in front of the other and keeps moving eventually gets there. And that's where all the rewards are. Not only that, that's where all the joy in life is. When you're really good at what you do, you feel wonderful about yourself. You're respected and esteemed by everybody around you. You can write your own tickets. You can open any door when you're good at what you do, because you get up in the morning and you know you're good. And that is more important than the rewards that go with it. The next key is to develop your unique talents and abilities. Every single person is designed from infancy with special talents and abilities that, if you develop them to their height, can enable you to accomplish anything you want in life. Everyone is genetically structured to be able to do something superbly, to do something they enjoy, to do it well, and to get great satisfaction from it. Peter Drucker often asked the question, What are you good at? What are you good at today? What should you be good at? What could you be good at? What will you be good at? And so one of the questions that we ask is, looking back in your life, what has been most responsible for your success up to now? What has been most responsible in the past? What is it that you have done that has gotten you the best results? Because as we said before, success leaves tracks. And if you look back into your past, you'll often find indicators that guide you to your future. Do you remember that fellow that won $300 million in the lottery? He was a high school physics teacher, and they asked him what he's going to do with it. He said he's going to take a week off and then get back to work, because he doesn't want to give up his job teaching high school physics because he loves his work so much. That is a person who's in the right place for him, and now he can just drive to it in a nicer car. Anyway, now the next key to becoming a self-made millionaire is to see yourself as self-employed. What we found is that the top 3% of adults in our society see themselves as self-employed. They see themselves as in charge of their own lives. When I started off my career as a young man, I was 21 years old working as a construction laborer, living in a one-bedroom apartment, broke, taking buses two hours every morning to get to work, and buses two hours to get back. I still remember that, and I still remember a light going off one evening. I was sitting there in my little apartment, in my little kitchen alcove, and I suddenly realized that I was responsible, that I was in charge of my own life that no one was coming to the rescue. And it was one of the great turning points in my life. So what you find is that all exceptional people are highly responsible people. 
they look upon themselves as self-employed. Sometimes I'll ask an audience, I'll say, how many people here are self-employed? And some people will raise their hand, and some won't. I'll say, no, what's the true answer to this question? And the true answer is that everyone is self-employed. The biggest mistake you can ever make is to ever think you work for anyone else but yourself. Even if someone else signs your paycheck for you all your life, the most valuable people in any organization are the people who treat the company as though it belongs to them. They see everything that happens as affecting them personally. They're not the nine-to-fivers, the no-hopers that say, yeah, well, I go to work. When I'm not at work, I don't think about my work. These people, somebody has told them that's a clever way to think. It's the way losers think. Winners think about their company, and when they're not there, they think about how they can do it better. When something happens in their company, they take it personally, because they see themselves as highly responsible. As a result, they're paid more, they're given more educational opportunities, they're promoted faster, and these are the people that eventually, like cream, rise to the top of every organization and every industry. The top 3%. The next key to becoming a self-made millionaire is to develop a clear sense of direction. Developing a clear sense of direction means that you need to become intensely goal-oriented. We find that all successful people are goal-oriented. There's an old saying, you can't hit a target that you can't see. You've got to know what you want in every area of your life. Some years ago, I worked with a Hunt Oil Company in Texas. The Hunt Oil Company was founded by H.L. Hunt, who became the wealthiest self-made multi-billionaire in the world. At his peak, he owned 200 companies and had a royalty income of $3 million a day. The most phenomenal man, by the way. And he was interviewed by a friend of mine on television before he died in the early 70s. And he was asked, What are the secrets to success? He said, The keys to success have only been two through all my life, and I will tell you what they are. He said, Number one, he said, Decide exactly what it is you want, and write it down, and make a plan to achieve it. And number two is, determine the price you're going to have to pay to get it, and then resolve to pay that price. Now, where the law of sowing and reaping, cause and effect, I learned an additional point to that. I learned that your current life today is the result of the price you've sown up to now. It's whatever you've put in, you get out. So, whatever you're getting out today, is a result of what you've put in. If you don't like what you're getting out, what you have to do is put in something different. What I found is this. Life is always just in the long run. So therefore, life says, this is the price you have to pay. And there's two qualities. First of all, you have to pay the price in full for your success. I've studied preparation, hard work, and so on. And second of all, you have to pay the price in advance. You don't get it afterwards. Where the world works is first you put in what you need to put in, and then you get out the rewards. So you have to ask yourself, what is the price that you have to pay to achieve the success that you desire? And you have to write it down and make a plan and work on it every day. Now let me give you a quick exercise, which is my only take-home or homework exercise for our time together. I want you to take a piece of paper like this and write down 10 goals that you'd like to accomplish in the next 12 months. Write the word goals and today's date at the top of the page. Write down 10 goals you'd like to accomplish, and then ask yourself this great question. If you could only accomplish one goal on this list but you could accomplish it within 24 hours, which one goal would have the greatest positive impact on your life? Now this is a great question because it'll usually jump out at you. You'll say, that's the one. If I had this, that would have more of an impact on my life than anything else. Sometimes it's a financial goal. Sometimes it's a health goal. Sometimes it's a relationship goal. But whatever it is, put a circle around that goal. Then turn the page over and write it at the top of the page. Set a deadline on the goal. Make a list of everything that you could think of to do to achieve the goal, and then begin working on your list. And here's the kicker. Do something every day. Do something every day that moves you one step forward towards your major goal. My promise to you that this exercise, selecting your most important goal, making a plan and working on it every day, will change your life in ways that you cannot imagine. They say that people begin to become great when they determine their major definite purpose, their number one goal, and work on it every day. It is the secret to becoming a self-made millionaire. It's the secret to great success in life. My promise to you is that a week, a month, a year from now, you'll look back and you'll be absolutely staggered at the difference it makes. I was giving a seminar not long ago, 
and a gentleman came up to me and said, You know that goal-setting exercise? It changed my life. Ten years ago, he said, I was broke, I was divorced, I was an alcoholic, and somebody dragged me to one of your seminars. He said, I did that exercise and I picked my major goal. He said, It changed my life. I said, In what way? He said, Today, he said, I'm worth $40 million. I said, Wow. He said, Yes, and I owe it to that lesson. Next is to refuse to consider the possibility of failure. It's the most amazing darn thing, is that the fear of failure is the greatest single obstacle to success in adult life. And it's not failure itself, because each one of you is a professional failure. Each one of you has failed over and over and over again. Isn't that true? All of us fail. All human beings fail over and over. Nine out of ten things that we try don't work out the way we expect. We have failures in relationships, in jobs, in careers, in investments, and everything. It's not the failure that holds you back. The failure makes you smarter. We say that it is the fear of failure, not failure itself, that holds you back. And the way that you overcome failure is you never consider the possibility of failure. The rule is this. There's no such thing as failure. There's only feedback. When you try something and it doesn't work, you get feedback, not failure. And recognize that most things you try aren't going to work the first few times. So what you do is you say, oh, that's an interesting bit of feedback. And you pick yourself up and you move forward. And you have more feedback and you move forward. To become a self-made millionaire, you're going to fail over and over again, year after year after year. But your brain has a cybernetic mechanism, which means that every time you try something, you get feedback which makes you smarter. And when you try something else, you get feedback which makes you smarter. And eventually, you reach the point where you're too smart and you stop making mistakes. You start to do more and more things right, and fewer and fewer things wrong. But you can't get there unless you have experienced the failures. Henry Ford once said that failure is merely an opportunity to more intelligently begin again. Now let me pass on one great rule to you, which has been discovered in interviewing self-made millionaires. See, millionaires look into every failure for something good. They say, there's got to be something good in this that I can benefit from. And surprise, surprise, they always find it. Self-made millionaires always seek the valuable lesson in every setback, obstacle, or temporary failure, and they always find the lesson. Now what do failures do? Failures whine and cry and think about what they've lost and blame their problems on someone else. Successful people say, what can I learn from this that will make me smarter next time? And my promise to you, those who seek, find, is that if you go looking for a valuable lesson in the biggest problem that you're facing today, you'll always find the lesson. Here's another possibility. Your biggest problem today could be the biggest gift that you have ever received, because it may contain within it the lesson that will make you successful. If you stop thinking about what happened and who's to blame, and you start looking for the gift within your problem, sometimes it can transform your life. The next key is to dedicate yourself to lifelong learning. Now what takes you from rags to riches is personal development. Personal and professional development. In the 21st century, as Peter Drucker says, knowledge and skill are the keys to the 21st century. And the only thing that will be relevant, the only skill that will be relevant in the 21st century, is the ability to learn new skills, because virtually everything you know is becoming obsolete at a rapid rate. Stephen Covey says that your current knowledge base has a half-life of two years, which means that half of everything you know will be irrelevant within two years, and two years from now, half more. So, if you're not continually learning and upgrading your knowledge and skills, you're not staying in the same place. As Pat Riley says, the basketball coach, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. If you're not constantly learning, you're actually falling behind. So, here are the three keys to continuous learning. Number one is read in your field 30 to 60 minutes each day. In other words, turn off the television, turn off the radio, put aside the newspaper, and just read in your field. The very best places to read, by the way, are books. Read books, the best-selling books written by the most successful people in your field, because books contain a wealth of riches that can enable you to function at a far higher level, to get much better results than you could before. So read 30 to 60 minutes a day. I've had people tell me countless times over the years that reading an hour a day has doubled and tripled their income within a year. The second thing you do is take every course that you possibly can, the courses and seminars that are available to you in your field, that are given by professionals, that are courses that have been developed over years and years and years. 
They have been tested and tested and tested. The person who is talking to you for several hours has spent thousands of hours learning their subject. They have dry tested this, or done test runs with thousands of other people. When you take a course, you can learn enough information in one or two days more than you could learn in two or three years, or maybe even a lifetime, while distilled and put together. People say, I can't afford a course. You cannot afford not to buy books. You can't afford not to go to courses. Some years ago, I had a dentist, and he was a very successful dentist. I was recommended to him by a friend. He was a dentist who retired at the age of 53, and just before he retired, he sold his practice for about $2 million. Just before he retired, he told me why. He said about eight years before, he had attended a dental congress in Hong Kong. He's from California. He had flown all the way to Hong Kong to attend this international dental congress because there were specialists giving private lectures, sort of plenary sessions, on the side. He attended this session, and it was on a particular technique of cosmetic surgery that this dentist had developed, that no one else knew, where you could basically straighten out a person's entire front jaw so they looked beautiful at a very low cost, at a very high level of effectiveness. He came back and he began implementing this in his practice. People began flying from 500 to 1,000 miles away. Every dentist sent their family members and themselves to this dentist. He was able to charge whatever he wanted to charge. He said eight years later, he retired as a self-made millionaire at the age of 53 to enjoy his money for the rest of his life. From what he learned from one session, at one convention, at one course. Now that's a true story, and maybe it's an exception, but you can never tell where the information is going to come from. The third way that you can upgrade your skills is to listen to audio programs in your car. The average driver drives 2 hours to 500 to 1,000 hours a year, 25 to 50,000 miles. If you listen to audio programs in your car, according to the University of Southern California, you will get the equivalent of almost full-time university attendance, just listening to learning material as you drive around. It can totally and profoundly change your life. Very, very important. Here's an interesting point. The more you commit yourself to becoming the best person you can be, the more you like yourself and respect yourself, the more energy you have, the bigger goals you set for yourself, the more you persist. When you invest in yourself and you read and learn and upgrade your skills, you're telling yourself, wow, I am a person with a great future, and it's up to me to maximize my potential. And your self-esteem goes up, your self-respect goes up, your sense of personal pride goes up, and you start to get promoted more and paid more in every part of your life. Well, the next is to develop a workaholic mentality. In our society today, all these people talking about take it easy, have balance in your life, relax, lean back, have fun at work, happy, happy, get along with your coworkers. This is loser talk. Loser, loser, loser. Now there's a time in your life when you can back off. All right? You can take it easy. But that's when you've made it. Not before you've made it. Because before you've made it, you're in competition with hundreds of thousands, millions of other people, like at the Olympics, who all also want to make it. And in order for you to win, you are going to have to work harder and work better and work smarter than they do. So the rule is to develop a workaholic mentality. What does this mean? It means that you start a little earlier, you work a little harder, and you stay a little later. Use what I call the 40 plus formula. The 40 plus formula says that working 40 hours a week gets you survival. And that's all. You work 40 hours a week to survive. You make no progress. You don't go ahead. You just barely hang on. Every hour that you invest in your work or yourself over 40 is an investment in your future. So you can tell what your future is going to be with unerring accuracy by looking at how many hours over 40 you put in. People say, well, my office is locked and I can't get in more than 40 hours a week. Then good. Then spend the rest of the time investing in yourself, getting better at your work when you do it. Now here's my second principle, and this principle changes your life. It is this. Work all the time. You work when you work. Work. Don't play. Fully 50% of working time today is wasted. And it's wasted in idle conversation, personal business, family phone calls, surfing the internet, reading the newspaper, drinking coffee, long lunch times, coming in late, and leaving early. And then the other 50%, you're scrambling because now you're behind because you wasted so much time fooling around. Now you start to work, and you don't work on high-priority tasks. You try to get rid of all the little stuff. So what happens is, 
the big tasks begin to build up like an avalanche overhang, and they cause enormous stress. And you go home at night, and you're thinking about this job. I've got to get this project finished, but I can't discipline myself to stop talking to my coworkers every time one of them comes in. I like automatic, like a conditioned response. It's blah blah time, chatter 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 chatter. No. What you have to do is work all the time. You work. If someone comes in and says hi, you've got a minute to talk. You say yes, but not now. Why don't we talk after work? Meanwhile, I've got to get back to work. I'll tell you what. Why don't you go down the hall and ruin his career? But don't stand here and ruin mine. It's really important. There's a great story. The little girl goes to her mother and says, "Mommy, why is it that Daddy always brings his briefcase home?" And he works in the evenings, and he works on the weekends, and he doesn't spend any time with the family. And she says, "Well, honey, you have to understand, Daddy can't get all his work done at work, so he has to bring it home." She said, "Why don't they put him in a slower class?" The next key is to get around the right people. This is a key for becoming a self-made millionaire. Get around the right people. Dr. David McClelland at Harvard did studies for 25 years, looking into why it is that some people succeeded greatly in life. What he found was, as much as 99% of your success in life is going to be determined by what he called your reference group. Your reference group are the people with whom you habitually associate. They're the people that you associate with at work, the people you associate with at home, your church, your political party, your social circle. What he found in working with people is that changing a person's reference group totally transformed the way they think. Why? Because we are like chameleons, and we absorb through the skin the attitudes, the opinions, the behaviors, the style of dress, the style of speech of the people with whom we associate most of the time. If you start to associate with winners most of the time, you find that they have a totally different worldview. They're positive. They're upbeat. They're focused. They're learning. They're growing. They're positive about what they're doing, and you start to become like that. We know that our relationships determine eighty-five percent of our happiness or unhappiness in life. They will drag you down worse than a sea anchor if you work for a bad boss. It'll destroy all your joy in work. If you have one negative coworker, they found that one negative person in an office can cast a darkness over the whole office because of his or her negativity. So the most important thing you can do is choose your relationships with care. And only associate with people that you like, respect, and enjoy being around. Next, be prepared to climb from peak to peak. One of the keys to becoming a self-made millionaire is to realize that life is never one continuous train; it's always up and down. So it goes up like when you climb a mountain peak, you have to go down into the valley before you climb the next peak. All of life is cycles and trends. There are up cycles and there are down cycles. There are up trends and there are down trends. The question is, what is the general direction of your trend? We say that life is two steps forward and one step back. Successful people focus on the two steps forward and then protect themselves on the downside. They build up cash reserves. They put in stop loss orders in the stock market. They very carefully watch what they're doing, so they try to maintain that two steps up and then make sure that the one step back is not so far. And then they want to make sure that this curve is generally upward, so that each time there's a step back. They're still further ahead than they were before. The next one is to develop resilience and bounce back. Developing resilience and bouncing back is one of the key qualities of self-made millionaires. Because, as I said right at the beginning, most things won't work. This is a very interesting point: is that you're going to be knocked down over and over again. What we know is, my friend Charlie Jones says, is you have to bounce, don't break. And when things go wrong, bounce. So. What I learned many years ago was this interesting technique of what is called mental rehearsal. Mental rehearsal says that you mentally prepare for the inevitable downturns before they occur. So you say, "All right, in the course of life, things are going to go wrong, but when they do, I'm not going to become upset. I'm not going to get mad or angry or anything else. I am just going to take it, learn from it, and pick myself up and keep going." Sometimes I ask this question: Does anybody here have any problems? Everybody says. Yes, everybody's got problems. Well, here's the rule: all of life is a continuous series of problems. They never end. The problems just keep on coming, like the waves of the ocean. The only break in this unbroken series of problems will be the occasional crisis. So, 
Life will be problem, 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 crisis, problem, 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 crisis. Like the waves of the ocean. Six problems and a crisis. Six problems and a crisis. Which means that everybody here is either in a crisis right now, has just gotten out of a crisis, or is just about to have a crisis. So what we have found is this. The hallmark of superior people, 30 years of research, is how you respond to a crisis, how you deal with problems, and how you respond to a crisis. And what we have found is that superior people look for the solution to every problem. They don't allow themselves to become upset and angry when something goes wrong. They say, okay, what's the solution? And they become intensely solution-oriented. When you have a very intense problem, that stimulates creativity to solve the problem. So what you do is you write and define the problem clearly. If you have a problem, you say, wait a minute, what is my problem? What is it that I'm worried about? And write it down. And the very act of defining a problem clearly often triggers the solution to the problem. One last technique that I want to give you with regard to your major definite purpose. And if you only do these two things as a result of our time together, they will transform your life. You've already identified the one goal that can have the greatest positive impact on your life. Now what you do is you take that goal and you write it at the top of a page in the form of a question. And you say, let's say your goal is to double your income. That could have a major impact on your life. You say, what are all the things that I could do to double my income in the next 12 months? Write it as a clear question. Even better, if you're earning $50,000 a year today, write, what could I do to earn $100,000 over the next 12 months? The more specific the question, the better. Then you devote yourself to writing 20 answers to this question. You must write a minimum of 20 answers. Work harder, work smarter, start earlier, stay later change occupations, upgrade my skills, whatever it is. Keep forcing yourself to write until you've written 20 answers. We call this mindstorming. The first three to five answers will be easy. The next three to five answers will be difficult. The last 10 answers will be incredibly difficult. But I have given this exercise to people who've gone on to become millionaires so many times I've lost track. Because they often find that the 20th answer changes their whole life. And if you've ever done this once, it's absolutely staggering. More people have become millionaires with this simple idea of mindstorming, what I call the 20 idea method, than any other single method of creative thinking ever discovered. Once you've got your 20 answers, pick one answer and take action on it immediately. It doesn't matter what it is. Just take one answer and take action on it. And that will keep you thinking and acting creatively all day long. The next key to becoming a self-made millionaire is to become an unshakable optimist. An unshakable optimist means that you think and talk about what you want most of the time. Optimists think and talk about what they want. They look for the good in every situation. They seek the valuable lesson. They're constantly feeding their minds with great ideas, which opens up new perspectives. What I have found is that optimists have three wonderful qualities. Number one is, they learn more things. As a result, they dramatically increase the likelihood that they will learn the right thing at the right time. Number two is, they try more things, which dramatically increases the likelihood that they'll try the right thing at the right time. And number three is, they persist. They never give up. Optimists make a decision that once they've decided they're going to become wealthy, they just never stop until they achieve that goal. Now, will they have many setbacks, obstacles, and difficulties? Yes. Do you know that almost everybody succeeds in a different direction from what they originally intended, or from what they originally thought? But they just keep going. Almost like a football player running down the field, running, blocking, changing, moving back and forward continually, but never lose sight of the goal. So, optimists learn more things, try more things, and persist longer. I want to leave you with the last two qualities of self-made millionaires. The second to last quality, is that they develop the qualities of courage and persistence. I said before, the biggest single obstacle to success is the fear of failure. The antidote to the fear of failure is the habit of courage. And what we know is that you need two types of courage to succeed. The first type of courage is the courage to begin. It's the courage to launch with no guarantees of success. Someone once said that if all obstacles must first be removed, nothing will ever get done. So successful people are willing to think, plan, make decisions, and then take action with no guarantees. We say, leap and the net will appear. Take action with no guarantees, and then learn. 
The second part of courage is the courage to endure. It's the courage to persist. It's the courage to keep on keeping on. It's to make the decision in advance that you will never give up, no matter what happens. You'll never give up. You will get knocked down over and over again. But you'll never give up. And the interesting thing is, if you make that decision in advance, you'll find yourself continually bouncing back. So, courage means the courage to begin, and the courage to endure. And the final quality of self-made millionaires, and Napoleon Hill called this the master key to riches, after studying 500 of the richest people in American history, he said it's the quality of self-discipline, it's the ability to make yourself do what you should do, when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. The quality of self-discipline is the quality that will make you a big success. It's the ability to force yourself to do what you know you should do. And here's the wonderful discovery. This persistence is self-discipline in action. Every time you persist, you build your self-discipline. Every time you practice self-discipline, you build your ability to persist. And the two of them are tied into your self-esteem. So, the more you persist, the more you like yourself. And the more you like yourself, the more discipline you have. And the more discipline you have and practice, the more you like yourself. As a result, the more you persist. And eventually, you get into an upward spiral where you become absolutely unstoppable. You reach the point where you know you can achieve the goal and nothing in the world can stop you. And every step that you take forward makes you stronger and stronger and stronger until finally people say, I know one thing about him. I know one thing about her. You cannot stop him or her. Once they decide they want something, they will not stop until they get it. And when you develop that quality, there will be nothing that is impossible to you. So, let me just leave you with these last points. We're living at the very best time in all of human history. More people are going to make more money in the next few years than have ever been made in all of human history. More people are going to become millionaires and are becoming millionaires today at a faster rate than we ever thought possible. And no one is better than you, and no one is smarter than you. And if you do what other self-made millionaires do, then nothing in the world can stop you from eventually getting the same results as other self-made millionaires. You're absolutely inundated with work and personal responsibilities, not to mention the piles of projects, stacks of magazines waiting to be read, and heaps of books you've been meaning to dive into. But let's face it, no matter how many personal productivity techniques you master, there will always be more to do than you can accomplish in the time you have available. The key to gaining control of your time and life lies in changing your mindset. You can only manage your tasks and activities to the extent that you prioritize and focus on the few activities that truly make a difference. By mastering these methods and techniques and applying them consistently until they become habits, you can positively alter the course of your life. In my career, I've discovered a fundamental truth. The ability to concentrate wholeheartedly on your most important task, execute it excellently, and see it through to completion is paramount for achieving success, recognition, and fulfillment in life. If you're like most people today, you're overwhelmed by the sheer volume of tasks and the scarcity of time. Consequently, you'll never be able to accomplish everything on your plate. There will always be tasks and responsibilities left incomplete. However, your success hinges on your ability to identify and prioritize your most crucial task at any given moment, and then promptly and efficiently tackle it. This skill is more impactful on your success than any other quality you can develop. Remember the analogy. If you start your day by eating a live frog, i.e. tackling your biggest, most important task first, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that the worst part of your day is behind you. If you have multiple important tasks, start with the most challenging one. Continually remind yourself that the most critical decision you make each day is what you choose to do immediately and what can wait. High performance and productivity stem from developing the habit of addressing your major task first thing every morning. Successful individuals are those who dive headfirst into their significant tasks and then commit to working steadily and with singular focus until those tasks are completed. In today's world, you're compensated for making valuable contributions and fulfilling expectations. Failure to execute is a pervasive issue in organizations where endless meetings and elaborate plans often fail to translate into tangible results. Your success in life and work largely hinges on the habits you cultivate over time such as setting priorities, overcoming procrastination, and tackling your most important task first. These habits are learned through practice and repetition, until they become ingrained in your subconscious and shape your behavior. Completing tasks, 
regardless of size or importance, gives you a sense of accomplishment and fulfillment. Developing the habit of initiating and finishing important tasks is essential for leading a fulfilling life and having a successful career. Practice is key to mastering any new skill, including focus and concentration. You need three qualities to develop these habits. A decision to prioritize task completion, discipline to practice these principles until mastered, and determination to make these habits permanent. You can expedite your progress toward productivity by envisioning yourself as someone who consistently completes important tasks promptly and effectively. Visualize yourself as the person you aspire to be, and through repetition and practice, you'll overcome procrastination and swiftly accomplish your most critical tasks, propelling yourself forward in your life and career. Clarity is crucial in personal productivity. The clearer you are about your goals and the steps needed to achieve them, the easier it is to overcome procrastination and focus on completing tasks. Establishing clear, written goals is vital. They serve as a roadmap to guide your actions and keep you motivated. Only about 3% of adults have clear, written goals, yet these individuals achieve significantly more than those without such goals. Setting and achieving goals involve a seven-step process. Decide what you want, write it down, set a deadline, make a list of action steps, organize the list into a plan, Take immediate action and commit to daily progress toward your goals. To put this idea into action, start by listing 10 goals you want to accomplish in the next year. Write them in the present tense, positively, and in the first person to reinforce them in your subconscious. Then, identify the goal that would have the most significant positive impact on your life if achieved. This exercise alone can transform your life, providing you with a clear sense of purpose, direction, and motivation. Finally. Have faith in your ability to achieve your goals. Faith, coupled with personal initiative and action, is essential for success. Maintain a positive mental attitude, surround yourself with supportive individuals, and view adversity as an opportunity for growth. Affirm your goals daily, and let your subconscious mind attract the resources needed to achieve them. In summary, by mastering the habits of focus, concentration, and task completion, setting clear goals, and having faith in your ability to achieve them, you can unleash your full potential and lead a fulfilling and successful life. What kind of house do you want to live in? What kind of car do you want to drive? What kind of wardrobe do you want? What kind of presents are you going to buy your wife for her birthday? I know it's the little things in your life that make the difference between happiness and unhappiness. When you affirm the object of your desires through prayer, let your imagination see yourself already in possession of the thing that you're aiming for. That's the best salesmanship in the world. When you grow up to sell a person an idea or merchandise or a service, if you know positively that you're going to give him his money's worth and more, it does something to you. It does something to him. It enables him to do that in return. Do something for you. If you want your prayers to be effective, don't wait until the time of need to utter them. Build up the habit of prayer when you don't need anything. Wouldn't it be an interesting thing if I gave you a little assignment right now to write down, before you go to bed tonight, everything that you have in this world to be thankful for. You may have a lot of things you don't want, but you also have a lot of things you do want. Write them down on this list and express gratitude that you have these things that you like. Then start by expressing gratitude every night and every day. Keep your mind open for guidance from within. Yes, hunches. You'll get hunches. Treat them with civility. Examine them, and you may find that some of these very unusual hunches that you come are bringing you messages that you need to get you over the hump in whatever it is that you're doing. And when you are inspired by hunches to move on some plan created by your imagination, accept the plan and act upon it. Always remember that there can be no such state of mind as faith without appropriate action. And when overtaken by defeat, as you may be many times, remember that man's faith is tested many times, and your defeat may be only one of your testing times. We all go through that testing time, and the ones that survive these tests can come out on top with an abiding faith. They are the ones that become truly great in life. Any negative state of mind will destroy the power of faith and result in a negative climax. Your state of mind is everything. That's the only thing you have control over. Your education, your background, your nationality, your creed has nothing whatsoever to do with your ability to achieve. It's the state of mind that you maintain. For me, that's the most profound thing in all of the knowledge of mankind. 
The most profound of all of it is the fact that the lowliest person can take possession of his own mind. Just the change of his mental attitude changes from success to failure almost instantly. A burning desire is the sort of material of which faith is created. There are a lot of desires in the world, but they're not burning desires, and they're not obsessional as ours. Most people in their whole life never express or never experience an obsessional desire for anything. We wish for everybody to have a lot of money without having to work for it. We wish for things. We wish for the Cadillac when we're driving a Ford. And if you want a Cadillac car and you make up your mind to have it, get out and see the men under you or the job that you're holding, and see that you put into it all that is required to get the Cadillac car. You have to weld them with a burning desire, and then you have to take action. You've got to start right where you stand with action. Now here are a lot of examples of men who have achieved. There's one down here that I particularly want to call your attention to, that of Miss Helen Keller, who believed that she would learn to talk despite the fact that she had lost the use of her speech, her sight, and her hearing. And yet, did you know, of course you do know, that Helen Keller became one of the best educated women in the world? And all she had to go by is the vibrations. I think with a woman with a handicap of that kind, all the way through life, getting joy out of life, rendering useful service, making speeches. If you have faith, keep your mind on that which you want, and not on that which you do not want. How does one go about keeping his mind on the things he doesn't want? The way you keep your mind off of things you don't want is to transfer your mind over to things you do want, and start talking about them. Start giving thanks for already possessing them. It won't sound silly to you because you know what you're doing. You're talking to your subconscious mind. You're re-educating yourself. You're keeping your mind fixed on things you want, and off the things you don't want. And if you ever feel blue or discouraged or lacking in courage, I'll tell you a good remedy for them. May I suggest you take a tablet and start my rings? Number one, the thing that you want most in life. Number two, the thing that you want next month. Number three, the thing you want next moment. Describe the look you want on it, whether you want to own a lot of acreage on top of the hill, or down below the road or above the road. How many rooms you want that house to have, how you want each room furnished. Do a little mental window shopping, and believe you me, you'll get it. You'll get your mind over that looting issue. Get it onto something that's constructive. Start right in doing something physically, writing down the things that you want. When anything bothers you, a lot of things that I can see have a lot of advantages I can use that I don't understand, but I don't need to understand them. I know which button to press to get the result I want, and I don't need to know how what happens between the pressing of that button and the result that happens. How would I know? Do you suppose that any person can actually make life pay off point by point, on his own terms, instead of accepting the circumstances? There is only one way in this world that I could possibly know that, and that's by my own experiences. Or can't get easily, that if you go back just a few years ago, what an astounding statement it is, because it's so broadly in contrast to what I might have said a few years back, before I'd learned the secret of getting everything that I want. You must have a definite objective, a purpose, a goal, before you can have faith in anything. Faith is a middle attitude wherein the mind is cleared of all fears and doubts, and directed toward the attainment of something definite through the inspiration of infinite intelligence. Faith's not going to go out and get you that Cadillac or that mink coat or that new house that you want, or that better job or that better business with all those clients that you need if you're a professional. But faith will guide you as to how you can do it and then you find that there is always a part that you misplace. And if infinite intelligence is very wisely provided a system whereby you can be sure of getting your food out of the soil of the earth, how? By complying with the laws of nature. You go out there and you plant the seed. You plant it in soil that you have examined to make sure it has the elements in there that you want into the plant. You plant it at the right season. You plant it at the right depth in the ground. All of those things you do by way of going the extra mile. You do them in advance, and you comply with nature's law. So that's what you do. You do your part. Faith will do nothing for you if you expect everything to be done for you outside of yourself. When faith, I'll put a little parenthesis or probably my little notey, that word probably down there. Why do you think I say faith probably works through the subconscious section of the mind? I'll tell you why I put it there. Because nobody knows definitively whether it does or not. It appears to work through the subconscious section of the mind. The subconscious acting is the gateway between the conscious section of the mind and infinite intelligence. Now, 
Another picture of what happens when you pray properly is, in your first condition, your mind. You know what it is you want, and then you give, you transfer over to your subconscious mind, a clear picture. The only way you can reach into infinite intelligence, in my book of rules, is to know it through your subconscious mind. You give it a clear picture, you know, of the thing that you want, you see yourself already in possession of it. And if your faith isn't great enough that you can see the thing already in your possession even before you start to get it, then you're not making use of applied faith. Associate as many as possible of the nine basic motives with the object of your definite major purpose. You've had this experience that you wanted something very badly, and in order to get something that you want very badly, it meant extra money that you couldn't lay your hands on. You didn't have it in the bank, you weren't earning it. Write out a list of all the advantages of your definite major purpose and call these into your mind many times daily. And it's the same thing with reference success. If you accept any kind of a fear complex or an inferiority complex, if you don't expect success of yourself and develop a success expectation or consciousness, you're not going to be a success. You just have to do that. If your major purpose is to achieve some material thing or money, see yourself already in possession of it. And if your faith isn't great enough that you can see the thing already in your possession, even before you start to get it, then you're not making use of applied faith. Associate with people who are in sympathy with you and your major purpose, and lead them to encourage you in every way possible. Don't disclose your aims and purposes to people who are not absolutely dependable, loyal, and close to you, especially loyal. But it's surprising how sometimes the people to whom you disclose your ideas, if they're good ideas, they go around the corner and beat you to the draw, and they're using your ideas before you use them, or they're saying something to discourage you. Don't let a single day pass without making at least one definite move towards the achievement of your major purpose. Your mental attitude is the sum total of your thoughts at a given time. A positive mental attitude has its roots in the spiritual wells of one's soul. Mental attitude is the medium by which adversities may be transmuted into benefits. You'll find some of those that appeal to you more than others. Make them your own. Surround yourself with suggestions. Everywhere you look, you'll see something that suggests a positive mental attitude. You'll notice when you go into the office of a successful person, or into the home of a successful person, if you can find these, then another place where he himself withdraws unto himself. You will find that oftentimes, he has himself surrounded with pictures of those whom he considers great. Oftentimes he'll have mottos on the walls. I've seen hundreds of them. I walked into my friend Jennings Randolph's office when he was in Congress in Washington. I found he had all of the walls of his congressional office covered with the pictures of men whom he considered great. He did that to live in the environment of the great, in the environment of things that kept his mind positive. Start in where you are, in your home, in your business, in your office, wherever you stay the most. Start in there to put up something that will give you a positive thought. Just before you go to bed, you'll be surprised at how much good it'll do you.